Happy, happy Sunday, everybody. This is the portion of the show where we go ahead and wait for the notifications to go out throughout the YouTube system. And I let the clock on the wall finish bonging 12 noon here on the west coast of the U.S. For those of you watching on replay, go ahead and just scrub forward in your timeline there until this graphic goes away. And it's at that point that uh, I go ahead and flick the magic swish, swish or switch for those of you who can speak and get started by pushing the button and saying, hey y'all, happy Sunday to you. Hope everybody is doing well. Everything is doing just fine here. It's kind of a cold, gray, yeah, trying to snow Sunday morning here in uh, Southern Oregon. But that's okay. We're going to uh, do what we can and uh, just kind of motor on through. Just kind of makes painting the shop shed project a little difficult. When you've got white stuff floating out of the sky. So, <laughs> yeah, well, life is what happens while you're busy making other plans. So, um, thank you for joining me. Thanks for spending part of your Sunday with me here. Uh, this morning, I released a uh, video that was basically an answer to a direct question I got from... A uh, gentleman by the name of Bill who wanted to know about carving a tapered hole using V-Carve Desktop specifically. And um, I had a few people mention different methods in the comment section about, uh, you know, just uh, adding draft to a 3D model and things of that nature. In Aspire, there are probably four or five different ways I could think of of doing this. But specifically, V-Carve, you're kind of limited. Um, so without knowing the exact type of taper he wanted, I kind of uh, just did a little bit of guessing and decided to go for something simple, which was a 45-degree angle. And uh, I didn't think that part through because somebody asked, well, why not just use a V-bit, a 90-degree V-bit? And that is a viable option. Um, there's obviously several ways of doing the same thing. So, if, but if you wanted, say, a 36-degree angle, unless you have a 72-degree angle bit custom made, I mean, you're just more or less stuck when you're talking about V-carve. So, I mean, there are several ways of going about the same thing, but this is one of those cases where the molding toolpath comes in, in that you can create, you can create files that are technically 3D, but not 3D. So, because the thing to remember is V-Carve isn't, never was, and I don't think ever will be, 3D modeling software. That's not its job. Its job mainly is uh, 2 and 2.5D. Two and uh, for 3D model cre creation, you basically need to move up to Aspire or one of the other various 3D modeling programs out there. So, uh, with that being said, this was a viable option. There are many, many ways to skin the proverbial cat, but... Uh, however you choose to do it. And and that's something that I try to impress in all of my videos. There may be several ways of do, doing the same thing. Excuse me. There may be several ways of doing the same thing. But if the method you choose gets you the finished product you want and it's done safely uh, without damaging the machine, the bits, the material, or yourself then it's a valid option. You know, if it works for you, it works. So let's, um, 
let's go ahead and uh, get into some of the questions that I had about that uh, video. Um, and that is, uh, see, David Blackburn wants to know, does the taper carve work as well in a square? Not in the same way. Squares are a little bit more tricky. You'll find that, depending upon what you want to do, you'll find that sometimes with a square, you have to break up the um, the square vector. It just depends. Sometimes you will have to break it up into four separate vectors and run each one as a separate cut. But for some reason, and I really don't know the reason why, for some reason on a closed vector, the molding toolpath wants to project the, the uh, profile outwards, away from the center. And I, I really don't know the reason for that. If somebody could enlighten me, I would be appreciative. Maybe I'll uh, send them a, a question and ask them uh, about that for sure. Um, again, if you are trying to go for a standard uh, angle, like a 45 or a 30 degree, just pick a V-bit and cut that uh, dimension, that angle in half, and that's what you're going to get. So if you're trying to get a 45 degree uh, taper, a 90 degree V-bit, draw the vector, carve on the vector or to the inside of the vector, and you'll get the uh, angle that you're looking for. If, uh, you know, 45 degree, 30 degree, uh, I'm trying to think of what all bits of uh, uh, 22 and a half degree, that's fairly common. But if it's something odd, then you kind of get stuck with the uh, molding tool path. Uh, as far as squares, triangles, ovals, uh, experiment. You know, I sometimes there is no right or wrong way. And you can't beta test for every contingency. So just get in and experiment. And if it doesn't give you the result that you're looking for, um, you know, try something different, you know. Let's see. Uh, Norm Peterson says, your video was a great help. Thank you. I've tried for two days on how to shorten a vector without drawing a new one. Very simple when you know the tricks. Getting into node editing, and I spend a lot of time focusing on node editing because a lot of it, a lot of it is, uh, a lot of patterns rather, depend on node editing. And just adding a new point and deleting the span or deleting another point is uh, the easiest way I've found to edit without having to redraw. Now, sometimes you do have to redraw. Um, I've had a video in my brain on cleaning up vectors and redrawing vectors after a bitmap trace. I just need to find the right bitmap to do the trace to demonstrate that. I mean, everything is coming out too clean. They have really made some improvements to the bitmap tracing over the years. It's nothing like it was back in uh, version 8 when I first bought VCarve. It's a lot better. They've really improved it quite a bit. And... Um, so it's getting harder to find really rotten vectors in something that is usable on YouTube, something that doesn't have copyright or trademark issues. So, uh, yeah, you can't go wrong with practicing node editing. You just can't go wrong. Let's see here. Um, let me kind of cruise down the list here and see about... Um, any more questions here? Um, Steve Purdue wants to know, how's the shed coming? Well, the shed was coming along. I am I was trying to have it painted by the end of the month until the weather changed on me. I got all the trim painted. All the bare wood is painted now. 
but the main body color is, or the main building color is not there yet. And it's not looking like that's going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> So, um, I'm still working on the inside, getting wiring pulled and everything else. It's been a balancing act. I mean, I have a lot going on here, so I only get a couple, three hours uh, at a time to work on it. So, Unique Woodcrafting says, got my CNC kit, can't wait to get it built. Yep, welcome to the crew, welcome to the club. It is uh, something that is going to change your life. Just uh, now, Motorsport wants to know why can't you use a two rail sweep? You can if you have a spire, and that was the point. He specifically asked for V carve desktop. Two rail sweep is not an option in V carve desktop. There are five or six ways of doing it in a spire, you know. Um, so, but when you're talking about V carve, it's uh, limited. So Let's see, Michael Johnson, icy and snowy Scotland. Yeah, yeah, okay. Let's see, Dave Gatton says, I'm just here for the new shop update, but it looks like I'm in the wrong place. Now, Dave, you're in the right place. I'm in the wrong place. I can't get it painted. <laughs> so, I'm still working on it. Uh, let's see... The Wood Burning Warrior says, My CNC is still in the box. Husband is working on another project. Then we'll break it open. Well, just remember, the Wood Burning Warrior, it is not a race. It's not a race because the minute you open the box, the learning begins. I will, however, give you one little piece of free advice, and that is whatever CAD CAM software you're going to use, and it doesn't matter what it is. The best time to start learning is yesterday. So get into it. Get into tutorials. And it doesn't matter which software it is. Start with the basics. Learn the new stuff. And just get in and practice it. There's no replacement for experience. The only way to get that experience is to do it. And I mean, I drew my just my name. I drew that in about 15 different ways. And deleted it and started all over again. You know, they, you can't learn that too soon. So, let's see here. Um, Luke and Caroline LaRoche. If you import a 3D model with a taper from a different software, will the tool path still work? If you import a 3D model that has a taper from a different software, whatever that model is, is what will be cut. Now you can add some other small details, like you could, um, if you're carving, if you're carving something in a dish, you could like bevel an edge, or you might be able to well, you can definitely increase, you can scale it up or down, increase or decrease the height. Um, in V-Carve, your options are limited. In Aspire, you have a lot more options available. But whatever that 3D model is, is should be what the, um, should be what is carved. And just preview often. That's all. So... Mr. Coffee Paul says, all is easy when you know how. That's absolutely true. And the hard part, for me anyway, is getting it out of my head and into the software. And that's just something that keeps going. The learning never stops. So, Steve Perdue says, how would you make round over edges at the top of a circle? Um, step one, get a point cutting round over bit. You have to have the right tool for the job. Um, the easiest way, and this is just me personally talking, is I have a handheld palm router, and depending upon the size of the project, of course, 
Um, I put my round over bit in it and I round it over after I'm finished cutting. Some projects you can't do that with. Get a point cutting round over bit that has the radius you're after. Import it into your uh, tool database and I find that and this is where the preview comes in. For some reason some some vectors it will want you to carve on the vector to round it over. Sometimes it'll want you to carve to the outside. Now you just have to preview it and if that doesn't work switch over go to the other one. I will do a video on round over bits. I do have a couple of point cutting round over bits. Yeah, I think I've, they're in my tool database. I've got a bunch of bits that I haven't even entered yet. But with doing the shed project, I don't even have uh, any time to get out and work on the machine. Okay, I just wrote myself a note to do a video on using a roundover bit. So, um, I have already, I think I've already done a video on um, entering a roundover bit in the tool database. And if I did, when I do the uh, roundover video I will uh, make sure to link that so uh, let's see I all says I left you a comment with some questions on the video itself sorry for doing it at the last minute I uh, may have to wait and answer that <laughs> so <laughs> later on uh, let's see could you discuss, uh, Jacques Petit Victoire says, could you discuss ascertaining 2D degrees you're copying from and what you're wanting to emulate in molding? Um, ascertaining the degrees you want, that's going to be dependent on the project. Uh, you know, if, if you're just looking to, for instance, drill a just make a countersink for a screw or something of that nature, it's probably going to be a 45 degree angle that you're looking for. But if it's a, if it's a specific angle that you're looking, and, and that was part of the video, if you're looking for a specific angle and you know that angle, then the only thing you need other than that angle is either a top diameter or a bottom diameter because you can you can either project up from the bottom and I mean this is in the uh, drawing stage this is not in the machining stage you do not want to machine from the bottom up and I'll get into that in a minute uh, you can either if you know the bottom hole diameter, you can project up at that angle based on the thickness of your material and get the top diameter. Or you can take the top diameter and the bottom diameter and knowing how big each of those are, that'll give you the angle. So you need two. You, you, of the three dimensions, you need two. You need either the top diameter and the bottom diameter, or you need the angle and either the top diameter or bottom diameter. You need one of those, you need two of those three. If it doesn't really matter, then you can use whichever you want. So, let's see. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Unique Woodcrafting says, I've downloaded the trial versions of VCarb Des Desktop and Pro. Which one should I install? Install the one you intend to purchase. Now, you can install both of them and try them both out and see the differences. That's what they're there for, is a free trial to see if it's compatible with you, if you like the software, and if it's compatible with what you want to do. Um, there are a few restrictions on vcarve desktop you have the uh, size limitation uh, there is no support for gadgets um, and other little things like you can't create a job sheet which goes down the list and summarizes the entire job that you have saved uh, so if you have a machine that's over 
25 inches by 25 inches, and I'm not sure what that is in metric. I should know this. Um, I would seriously consider going with VCarve Pro, but there are a lot of people that have larger machines that start with VCarve Desktop because it's a little bit cheaper. Well, it's a lot cheaper. And then move up to VCarve Pro. And that's one of the great things about Vectric software is they give you credit for what you've already purchased. If you purchase VCarve Desktop and then six months later decide you want to move up to VCarve Pro, you only pay the difference in price between the two software titles. So you're not spending and then spending again a huge amount for the full retail. You just pay the difference in price. And they update your license and you go online to your portal through V and Company and you download the new software. And everything is done. So, uh, let's see. Steve Purdue says, I'm taking a class online now sponsored by Next Wave using Vectric VCarve. Four two-hour classes. Wish I took it a year ago. Yeah, you cannot start learning it too soon. Um, and eCabinet Tips and Tricks hit the nail on the head. Learning CAD CAM software is a lot like playing video games. It's addictive. It is. I mean, I take a lot of teasing, and rightfully so, on my logo. I drew that in VCarve because I know how to use it. I don't know how to use Adobe Illustrator or Inkscape or anything like that. I drew it in VCarve, exported it, and uh, then filled in the colors in my photo imaging software. So it gets addictive. <laughs> so uh, let's see. Let's go here. Um, uh, Mark Kulig says, off topic, any problems with VCarve Pro constantly locking up while bitmap tracing and calculating projects? That may be a computer issue. Um, First thing I would do is I would look to see if what is running in the background that's using a lot of resources. I find that my web browser tends to be the biggest resource hog. Um, and on this computer, it's not an issue. But on my old computer, it was an issue. And the only thing that fixed it was I added more RAM to the computer itself. And that solved that issue. So... Um, that sounds like a computer limitation. If it's not, send an uh, email to Vectric support and let them know what's going on. They might be able to talk you through it. There may be other background issues. It may be a program running in the background that is not compatible with VCarve or Aspire. So, let's see. Um... Flavian Lewa, excuse me. What if I work with a closed vector but use the bottom diameter as my rail and set the profile to start from the top going downwards? Let me wrap my head around that. Uh, use the bottom diameter as my rail and set the profile to start from the top going downwards. It may or may not work. Um, I did have somebody ask a question of why not use the bottom diameter as the rail and go ahead and project outwards. And that may work just fine for some machines, but you have some, you introduce some issues. Number one, when you're telling the software to start at, with a small diameter in the middle and run outwards, taper outwards like so, your bit's going to move over and plunge all the way through the material and then start working its way back out this way. Now, if your machine and your tool can handle plunging and cutting all the way through, say, hard maple in one pass, then by all means. Most home hobby machines can't do that. Uh, you can do anything once. But <laughs> once only. Most home hobby CNCs just won't be able to handle something like that. So you want to try to taper down from the outside, not from the middle. And again, you're asking what about trying to get it to project downwards? Give it a try. 
it may work. Preview it. It might work. But uh, I haven't had that experience. So, uh, let's see. Grant says, I do a lot of rectangular picture frames, but the only way I've gotten the molding tool path to work is to use the inner rectangle as the drive rail. Yeah, exactly. That's just one of those things. It's, it, it's going to project out on a closed vector. And I really don't know why that is. So, let's see. Um, George W., best bit for acrylic engraving. I have never carved in uh, or engraved on acrylic, so I'm the wrong person to ask that. If anybody can help George W. out with that, uh, I'd appreciate it. I have never cut acrylic. I want to. It's just right now, life is on hold until the shop gets fish finished. Let's see. Lane Byron says, Do you know how to make that tapered circle and aspire so the tool path runs a full 360 per pass? You have uh, two whale sweep. You have uh, create a uh, 3D shape and then add draft. Um, I'll do a video on it running over a couple of uh, different um, a couple of different uh, methods. Let's see. 3D taper aspire. I'll, I'll do a, a video and run over a couple of different options for that in Aspire. So let's see. Uh, David Williams, when no node editing, is there a way to join shapes easier than increasing the size of the individual shapes to get an overlap, then weld them, then delete, soften each point? Um... Yeah, yeah, either way, you have to connect them. Um, oh, wow. I'd have to get a, I'd have to see a screenshot of what you're trying to work on because uh, it's hard to give a blanket, yes, do this, uh, because some shapes lend themselves better than others. And it's going to depend on whether you're using straight lines, arcs, Bezier curves. Um, there, it, there's a lot more involved than just saying yes or no. Um, and, and a lot of times, David, the way you're doing it is the easy way. So, and it, yeah, and it, it gets nitpicky, but you know, <laughs> what can you say? Okay. Doug Rothenberger. Hi, Mark. I've recently started thinking about cabinet building and how to cut cabinet parts. Do you have or talked about dealing with hardwood ply thicknesses, dado, or rabbits to match the ply? Not specifically for cabinetry, but I've said many times and I continue to say it, measure your material before you start creating vectors for like rabbits or dados, things of that nature. Uh, material varies. Now, if you're working, if, if you're thinking about getting into production, that can sometimes be a bog down and you have to, there has to be a little bit of a, a tolerance there. But generally speaking, coming, coming from a cabinet shop background, generally speaking, the material is fairly uniform. I mean, there might be a variance, oh, plus or minus 5%, if that, on thickness. Because I, if you went out with uh, a set of micrometers and um, went through a pallet of plywood sheets, you'd be hard-pressed to find two that were exactly the same thickness. But there's a little bit of a variance and a tolerance there. And most people have a builder's tolerance. I mean, our cabinet shop, depending upon what we were doing, we had up to a 1 16th of an inch builder's tolerance. So, you know, wood is going to change, wood is going to swell. Just applying the glue, the moisture in the glue can cause a dado to swell to the point to where um, a cabinet bottom might not fit into the side. So 
Um, experiment with scrap or material that you can afford to burn through and um, figure out what works well for you. We get so fixated. It's easy to do, too. We get so fixated on tolerances being perfect, but you are not going to get a three-quarter of an inch piece of material into a three-quarter of an inch dado. There, One of them there, there has to be a tolerance there. Either the material has to be thinner than three quarters of an inch or you're going to have to go larger on your dado because you, there, you can't have a press fit with wood. It doesn't work, even plywood. So, let's see. Okay, I.L. Peleg says, it looks like the resulting tool paths are using both normal and climb milling. Was this intentional? Can this be avoided? Um, yes, it can be avoided, and that is to change the start points, which is something I didn't do. I didn't look in the direction of, uh, the, um, which direction the bit was going. Now, if you wanted to run both halves of that circle, in my example, climb, you would have to change the start points and look at the direction of the arrows in that preview when you're first setting up your uh, uh, when you're first setting up your um, vectors when you're first setting up the molding toolpath look at the direction now if you right click and hit change direction it's going to ch also change which way the uh, the profile is projected so watch out for that but so don't try it that way just go into node editing and change the start point on that vector and it'll go in the in the, the opposite direction um, from the second example I understand that the inner circle is actually not used for anything is that right um, let's see that was through the no, it, it isn't used really for anything other than just a gauge when you're setting up for drawing the vectors. So, yeah, you could probably delete that uh, inner circle. Because uh, I took the vectors from the through hole and just copied them straight over into the stopped hole, the dish, as it were. And uh, I didn't delete it. I was... The video kind of came about very quickly. So, let's see. Uh, Tim Schaefer, I have purchased some bits from Speedtool, I guess, and having trouble finding correct data on these. Any suggestions where I may find these, or should I just chuck them and start over with them? And I, well, I wouldn't chuck the bits. I mean, it depends upon what bit you're using. As a general rule, for instance, a quarter-inch upcut spiral end mill is a quarter-inch spiral upcut end mill. Personally, I haven't found anything different between a Mana, Whiteside, or Bosch. It's an upcut spiral. It's an upcut spiral. If you're talking about something like a form tool, you do need the data. But if you're looking at something like a 60 degree V bit, a 60 degree V bit is a 60 degree V bit. I mean, you know, you don't need specific data on some bits. It just depends on what you're doing. If it's a form tool, you do need that data. But if it's something generic, then whatever's good for one is usually good for the other. Usually. Let's see. Um, uh, I.L. Peleg says, would I be right to say that you are not limited to a straight line? I'm assuming you mean the profile and could use the same method to create an OG style cut without the need of an OG bit. Exactly. That's what it was made for. Let me pull up a, I'll start a new Aspire here. Well, no, I'll use one of the other ones that I'm already using. Let me pull up the uh, through hole here. That's not it. It's the other one. 
And then I will uh, screen share, make sure that I'm sharing, and I am. Uh, yes, I am. Okay. Let me throw something at you here, I all, and maybe you folks don't know it. If you come down to clip art and go into clip art, and it's down here under molding profiles. These are 2D profiles that they have provided you for use with the molding toolpath. So if you wanted to create your own OG profile out here, you sure could. Or you could enter this profile, for example, and cut that with the molding toolpath. Now, obviously, you'd have to scale it to the length you're trying to project. But this toolpath would is just as viable as this here. Um... And so is this one. That's exactly what the molding toolpath was made for. And they provided some sample. Here's nine different profiles right here that they have provided. And you can create your own. Um, and in fact, if you get into the information that comes with a form tool, let's say you buy an OG bit, the manufacturer's website should have a um, profile for you to download to enter into VCarve or even uh, Fusion 360. You can take that vector and export it into this folder if you want to or into another folder of your own. But that's exactly what that uh, toolpath was invented for was to be able to project those uh, those profiles onto the uh, molding toolpath. Let's see. Um, let me try to get caught up here. Um, uh, unique wood crafting. How long do the trial versions last? You know, I don't think there there may or may not be a time limit. I'm not sure if there's a time limit on the tri trial version. But generally speaking, if you're you if you've had that trial version for more than about 30 days, you should have decided by then if it's something you want to pursue or not. I mean, it took me about 15 minutes to figure out that uh Fusion 360 was just not for me. You know, it wasn't the type that I was going to use. It took me about a week to decide that SolidWorks was not for me. But, you know, that's, you know, that's just me. Your mileage may vary. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jacques Petit Victoire says, any chance you could demo how to use the correct top edge and bottom edge to obtain an unknown angle degree? That's what the first demonstration I did was. I knew the top diameter and I knew the bottom diameter. And when I projected that line, when I drew that first angle between the guides, I had the, I knew my material was a half inch tall. So I had my guideline set a half inch apart. And I knew the space between the inner and outer was a half inch wide, so I drew my vertical guides. Then in those corners, I drew from corner to corner, and it just so happened that that was 45 degrees. That was how I found that angle. So that was the first, the, the first taper I demonstrated, was showing how to use the top edge and bottom edge to obtain that unknown angle. So... Uh, let's see. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, McKinney Woodworking says, Aspire 10.5 molding tool path has a very step over option. Yes. I would assume it would vary from zero to whatever I set 
as my tools step over and not higher. Yes, it won't go above the step over you have created. But if it needs to, like if there's a, a certain angle, it will vary that step over to get a cleaner cut. So, yes, but it will, it shouldn't go over what you have set. If you have it set for 10%, it shouldn't go over 10%, but it might drop down to eight or six or five if it feels the need to do so. So, uh, let's see. Steve Purdue says style and rail doors are easier on a router table with Freud style and rail bits. That's, that could be true, but again, you're looking at a router table. Do you have a router table? If you don't, you know, you could always build one. Um, but, um, uh, and it, it, it's easy to, it, it, it is easy to build a router table, but if you have a CNC and you're in a limited work environment, uh, limited shop space or what have you, uh, and boy, let me tell you, I'm an expert at that. My router table is a benchtop model that I set up on sawhorses out in the driveway, unless it's a day like today, um, then there are ways of doing it. But yeah, the CNC is not always the right tool for the job. You know, um, if you're drilling two holes, get out the hand drill or the uh or take it over to the drill press if you've got 36 holes of different sizes in specific places that's where the cnc shines so uh let's see david williams thanks i should have taken your advice on your tutorial on bitmap tracing start simple uh, yeah, <laughs> start simple. And the way I learned that was by not starting simple and not getting experience using the tools, but diving headfirst into a bitmap that I had no business attempting to trace because I found out the hard way it's basically untraceable. But I was being stubborn and it wasn't the bitmap per se. It was the bitmap that I had. The design is perfectly doable. The bitmap I had was itty bitty thing with very teeny tiny resolution and you couldn't get any kind of detail out of it at all. It was a bad candidate. And while we're on the subject of bitmap tracing, that's probably the hardest part is learning what bitmap is a good candidate for tracing and what bitmap you should just avoid entirely and that just comes with um, doing it over and over and over again i mean the first clue is find the highest resolution image you can find and if you're taking the picture you're trying to trace a photograph that you took Make sure that the outlines are highlighted in some way. I mean, if that means putting the object, if it's an object, putting the object on a white background or a high contrast background, if it happens to be white, put it on a black background. Just, you know, light it very well and make sure you can find all of the, uh, all of the edges that you want to trace. So that's the hardest uh, let's see. Richard Canton says pocket dimensions run different from drawn vector size. Can you comment? A lot of variations. There's a, excuse me, there's a lot of variables there. It could be anything from the bit diameter is not as advertised. There is a tolerance there. When they say a quarter inch, that's nominal. It may actually be cutting a little oversized or slightly undersized. Um, there is run out on the router or spindle. There is tramming issues maybe involved. Maybe you've got some nod or some tilt or some nod. Um, it, there are several, several variables that could be there. Uh, let's see. Let me... Uh, I'm trying to scroll down to find questions with well, lots of comments on acrylic. Lots of uh, uh, comments on uh, saving memory in the browser. And Mike Mazalik has said there is no time limit on the trial versions. Thank you, Mike. 
I appreciate that. Um, uh, uh, let's see. Abhishek Nir says, if dark matter attracts and dark energy repels, don't you think we're stuck in a loop of the Big Bang and singularity and you've done this live stream a million times? No, but I have answered that question a million times. But thank you for asking. Let's see. Um, okay, I think think I am caught up. What do you know? Okay, Frankie CNC and Woodworking Channel says, I'm closer to the time to start building the big CNC. Internet rule number one, Frankie, Pixar, it didn't happen. You know the deal. Joe of Wood Studio IA says, if drilling holes, can you use a drill bit or do you have to use an end mill? Newbie question. No such thing as a bad question. I'm... Okay, in a CNC router, do not use a drill bit. And I say that because drill bits were not designed or made of the proper material to spin at the RPMs we have. I... It also depends on the spindle and router you're using. Now, if you're machining metal and you're using a metal, um, a, a, um, a spindle that is made for milling metal, then it's capable of gearing down and slowing down to the type of RPMs that you can use the drill bit on. But generally speaking, wood, the router or spindle is going to spin too fast to, uh, for how it was designed. Use an end mill. If you're attempting to drill a hole straight down in the wood, for instance, a quarter inch hole with a quarter inch bit, use an upcut bit. I've told this story before. If you use a downcut bit, you will start a fire. A downcut bit ejects the chips down into the hole where it's trying to drill, and friction will start a fire. I did it. Use an upcut bit. Now, if you're using an 8-inch end mill to drill a quarter-inch hole, you're pocketing it out. The chips have somewhere to go. You can use an upcut or a downcut, either or. It doesn't matter. But if you're drilling a hole, and it doesn't matter if you're peck drilling or not. I was peck drilling. So, just use an upcut if you're drilling a hole the same size as the bit. So, let's see. Uh, John Gallant said, missed my comment, but it's okay. Let me kind of go back up here and see if I can find John's comment. You may have to repost it. What's up? Good to see you. Oh, I see that comment. No, I didn't miss it. I just had to try to catch up. Ah, let's see. Yvonne Langevin says, on your first example, could you use an inside profile to remove the center of the pocket? Yes, you could. But you have to figure out a way to secure that centerpiece that's going to come flying out of there if you don't secure it. So figure out a way to secure that piece. Personally, I tend to pocket it out because, generally speaking, I'm not looking to save it. A pocket toolpath does take a little bit longer, but if you remember the toolpath in the video, it was nine minutes long. So, I don't see saving all that much time. As a home hobbyist, if you're in production, you're probably using a va uh, vacuum table on a big machine, then be my guest, whatever you decide is a way to hold down that piece in the center is fine. You could use tabs if you want, but now you get to go back and clean up those tabs. And, wait a minute. Mike Mazalik, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think you can use tabs in a, uh, in a molding tool path. 
I, I, it seems to me that I remember that. I don't think you can use tabs with a molding toolpath. So, um, you're probably stuck with either using double-sided tape or using uh, tape and CA glue to make sure the whole thing is stuck down. But yeah, you could use a profile toolpath. Like I say, there is more than one way to skin the proverbial cat. So, okay, and Mike just confirmed with that. No, you cannot use tabs with a uh, molding toolpath. So, it seems to me that I remember something about that. I think I tried to do that on another project, and I couldn't figure out how to do it. Norman Peterson, just use tape and super glue. Preach, brother. Preach, brother. <laughs> I hate double-sided tape. I don't have it in here anymore, but I had a headstock I used to, uh, a guitar headstock I used to show people. I was using double-sided tape on a router table and was had a template. And I had used double-sided tape to uh, attach that to that headstock. And the tape warmed up just enough to where that adhesive started to fail. And running it through the router table, and the template slipped, and I cut right into the middle of it. Oh, I was mad. Oh, I was mad. Oh, well. Okay, let's see. I am think of, holy cow, 50 minutes we've been on here. I hope I got everybody's question. So um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. Next week, I'm not exactly certain what I'm going to do. I might do the round over. I might do the 3D taper and aspire. But I also had a request of uh, somebody asking about uh, level clipping in aspire in the, uh, in the uh, component tree on the modeling tab. And I was going to do a video on that about oh, six, seven, eight months ago and got sidetracked with life, the universe, and everything. Um, so I might go ahead and get into clipping next week. I'm not really sure yet. So um, for everybody who's been commenting about cutting acrylic and what have you, thank you for the uh, tips and pointers. So... Um, let me see. One last question here. Suicidal at all times. <laughs> Still cracks me up. Um, when I make a part 0.125, it will set the zero plane to 0.1235. This is where I'm getting that issue I talked about last week. I think. What is it doing this for? Um, I shoot me an email through my um, the contact us page that Steve has just linked. And there, find a link in the description below for that. Uh, shoot me an email and uh, we can get on and kind of discuss a little bit better and uh, go from there. Um, yeah. So, uh, Dean Howard, I finally see you. I lost the tracking information. Did you get your order? Uh, I cannot find the tracking number to save my life and I need to make sure that it got to you or see if it's still stuck in customs or what's going on. Normally, I'm right on top of that. So I'm waiting for Dean to answer me now. So, <laughs> but yes, uh, suicidal at all times and I'll finally learn your name. Go ahead and shoot me a... Uh, message. You did. Okay, good. All right. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up here. As, as I said, I'm not sure what next week's video is going to be. Thank you all for two days ago and you ordered it before Christmas. Holy cow. Thank you, Postal Service. Oh boy. Well, uh, thank you all for joining me. Thank you all for spending part of your Sunday with me and I'll see you next week. Now get outside and go do something, man. Don't hang around with me in here. If I mentioned anything, um, no, I have no, I have no, I have no links to post. So this is me saying, bye, y'all. Take care. Have a good one.